School Board is called to order at uh, 5.32 p.m. Tuesday, June 5th, 2018 in room 137 of the Edison Building. Present at the board table is Mr. Michael Munoz, Superintendent of Schools and a non-voting ex officio member of the board. Also present is Ms. Wendy Edgar, the Assistant Board Clerk. Ms. Edgar, would you please call the roll? Mr. Barlow. Mrs. Becker. Here. Chair Marvin. Here. Mr. Susner. Here. Ms. Seelinger. Here. Mr. Smith. Ms. Workman. Let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 2.01 approval of the agenda are there any changes yes there are a few our uh, CFO went home sick this afternoon so item 502 approval of current technical education collaboration agreement has has been added item 711 renew of contract services for ISD 35 self insurance trust fund program item 712 approval of the group life insurance policy renewal Item 713, approval of the group long-term disability poly policy renewal. Item 714, approval of site agreement with UCI Towers. And item 715, approval of amendment to services agreement with UCI services have been removed. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of approving the agenda as modified, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 3.01, recognitions. Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this first, I'm going to have John Pertus come up and introduce our students. for Women in Information Technology uh, Award in Minnesota, um, and they both received um, uh, honorable mentions, and so you can, uh, I hope they will continue to uh, pursue, if not careers, at least their interest in IT, and uh, that uh, they will um, continue to um, be awarded because they're both really awesome students. So, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, please come on up, ladies, and just um, introduce yourselves. Thanks. And maybe just say what you like about IT. Hi, I'm Ingrid. I'm a junior at Mayo right now, and I really like programming. I do AP Computer Science, and I've done a couple of programming camps, and also I'm on the local FRC robotics team. I'm, I'm Kaisa Arnold. I'm a freshman at Mayo. I do programming a lot in my spare time. I just enjoy it because there's so many different creative things you can do with it and a lot of different ways to help people and make things easier for others. Thank you. So out of uh, several hundred nominees, uh, I think there were 25 finalists. Um, so um, in, in the state of Minnesota, I think five of them went on to the national level, um, but I'm really proud of these girls, so congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Nancy Denzer, the principal at Willow Creek, to join me. Tonight we are recognizing Nancy as the Southeast Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals of the Year. I'm going to read a little bit about the uh, 
Andrew Newman, who is the, currently the assistant principal, nominated Nancy for this award. I'm going to read some of the comments he made. Nancy has dedicated her life to growing both students and staff. She has reached out to collaborate with many principals in the southern part of the state to learn from yet also to support. In the past two years, Nancy has led the way in creating opportunities for students to be more successful through fostering stronger teacher-student relationships. Throughout my two years at Willow Creek, and as Nancy sets to retire at the conclusion of this school year, I have never known someone so dedicated to the overall growth of everyone she encounters. Staff voice and input matter to her. She has created an environment where new ideas and concerns are able to be voiced. The growth of Willow Creek has greatly improved due to her due to the influence of Nancy. Congratulations, Nancy. Um, thank you so much. It's an honor to work in this district, and it's real bittersweet to be leaving it, but um, I'm leaving at a good time, and uh, Willow Creek's in a great place. So thanks so much for your support. It's been wonderful all these years. Point oh two powwow, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm uh, going to call Guthrie up, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the powwow that we had recently, and then I think we have a video as well. Thank you, everybody, for having me today. I'm excited to show you guys this video. I prepared a little statement so we can kind of talk about what happened that day. Um, so I appreciate the platform and the opportunity that I've had since joining Rochester Public Schools. Uh, this event is an ex excellent example of these opportunities. I worked in collaboration with the parent committee as, what, as we hosted a fantastic event with our first ever Wazupi Wee Wachipi. Sorry, I have to keep looking down. I haven't practiced this much. Uh, on May 19th. The Wazupi Wee Wachipi translates in Dakota to the moon of planting things powwow. We invited three drum groups uh, representing the Prairie Island Indian community, Red Lake Nation, and a group from our urban American Indian neighbors from the cities. Uh, one additional drum group from the cities attended as well. There were about 30 dancers uh, who registered and wore regalia that day. Um, this included men, women dancers of different styles, as well as youth royalty from different native communities around the state and beyond. I personally was fortunate that my dad traveled from Idaho uh, while my aunt, uncle, and cousin came from the Standing Rock Reservation area in South Dakota. I was proud to have both my uncle and my cousin dance at the powwow. Uh, the significance of this day cannot be understated. Uh, from 1863, when Dakota people were awaiting exile at Fort Snelling, until the American Indian Freedom Religious Act was passed in 1978, such a day would not have been legally been permitted in the state of Minnesota. From the Wounded Knee Massacre in the winter of 1890 until 1978, these ceremonies would not have been permitted anywhere in our country. The students who were recognized with feathers and blankets on May 19th are the Lakota and Dakota descendants of those people at Wounded Knee and those who were exiled. I feel we've made uh, so much progress, but we must continue improving. In the same week as the powwow and graduate celebration, a parent informed me that a fake headdress was used by some elementary students during History Day presentations. Headdresses are sacred to some tribes, but often used inappropriately to categorize a look for all Native peoples. I appreciate the efforts and collaboration from different apartments, our school board, and the schools throughout the district. The program here would not be as successful as, today, as it is today without the support of so many. The event was great, and the amount of support I received from the parent committee, uh, facilities, uh, John, I'm just going to go Dixon, uh, Nicole Osterhout and the media staff was fantastic. During the powwow, we recognized our American Indian graduates. We had nine graduates this year, seven of whom uh, were able to attend the event, uh, five students from Lakota nations, three students from Dakota nations, and one student from an Ojibwe nation. Our graduates were able to sit down with our MC and elder Jerry Dearly the night before to take in the moment a little bit more and to learn about what was going to happen the following day. Um, thank you for allowing me to address you all here today and present our first annual Wazupi Wee Wachipi video. 
Let's take a look at the fantastic day we had here at Rochester Public Schools. graduation block. Yes, we have a, another little video to share with you. This is uh, something that just took place, I, I think it was last week, if I recall. Uh, we started this just a couple years ago, having our uh, graduates walk through their feeder elementary and middle schools. And this was actually the idea of, of one of our social workers at Mail a couple years. And he came to us and said, can we try it? And we tried it and had such positive feedback that we continue to do it every year. So this is uh, just a little video we created to uh, show you what happened that day.
don't know if some of you observed the faces of little ones as, as the graduates were walking through. Uh, if you look back at our wall, it says to contribute to future generations. Uh, this is just one way that our older students can show the younger ones this is what it's all about. This is what you're trying to accomplish here. And I think it uh, sends a very positive message and a good uh, way to contribute to future generations. Well, and let me just say too, I hope that that those seniors walking through, not only did they get another opportunity to wear their cap and gown, but I hope they were looking at those spaces too. Um, you know, even as seniors in high school, they have a big influence over our, our younger learners. And what a great uh, tangible way for these little kids to get in their, their head right away. I'm doing that. I mean, I'm doing that. I'm gonna graduate. So for every single kid to know that, I think that's, whose idea was this? Uh, Juan, who's a social worker at uh, Mayo. You could have taken credit, but. <laughs> no, I said it was a social worker at Mayo. Okay. <laughs> wasn't my idea. Okay, well, anyway, um, but I think it's just. I did okay it, though. <laughs> Got to oh, count well, for something. Yeah, okay, that's, that's important. That's important, so thanks for that. Thank you. Um, 3.04, school board committee assignments updates. Are there any board members who would like to give an update on committee work that you've done since the last meeting? Ann. Um, I have some uh, policy work that we did, but I'll talk about that later. Okay. Thank you for your work on policy. Sure. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I have a, a few things to report um, from the community engagement committee. Not all of these are, are official committee work, but especially because I'm on that committee, I feel like I have license to go to every single uh, school event that there is, and it is stunning the number of amazing things we have going on in different schools. For one thing, uh, there was a Hawthorne graduation on May 17th. On June 4th, um, there was a, a poetry reading at the public library. These were STEM kids. This is a charter school, but it was great to see kids writing and reading their poetry, getting inspired. At the Alternative Learning Center, they had a workshop there where students wrote poetry uh, with a mentor, and then they did a poetry reading uh, for an audience. And these kids, some of them especially, did amazing work and read their poetry with such passion. Uh, there was a volunteers and education gathering on May 21st at John uh, Marshall, on May 16th at Riverside, Taylor Hawkins, who's with the Foo Fighters, I don't know what that is, and um, <laughs> Mike, Mike Arturi, who is with Love and Spoonful, Spoonful I do know who that is, um, had been working with kids, especially uh, Mike, working with kids at uh, Riverside as part of the Turnaround Artist Mentors Group. So they'd been working with these kids about how to be a drummer, and then the last day of the workshop, these two guys showed up and just went nuts on their drums. And the kids, it was stunning, this gym full of kids. And you know they were sitting and they were watching kind of open-eyed and, and slack-jawed, just amazed at the skill of these drummers. And then when they couldn't take it anymore, they got up and started dancing. <laughs> and these guys, I bet, drummed for 20 minutes. The audience went crazy, but it's wonderful for our kids to get music, and drumming is music. Um, and to have that kind of opportunity um, to be involved with the arts. Uh, we also had a meeting, uh, the community focus team had a meeting. Uh, we're continuing to work with this group about how um, that uh, committee and our school district are gonna work together as we continue to um, close the gaps that exist and uh, do the best we can for all of our kids. Okay, I've talked a lot. Anybody else? Thank you. Consent agenda. Any items to be pulled off the consent agenda for separate consideration? Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Yes, I just want to uh, call your attention to item uh, 408. That's an annual payment we make to RCTC for students that take PSEO uh, courses. So. Uh, we typically just add that as a consent agenda, uh, a consent agenda item since it's an annual uh, bill that we play. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Okay. Um, all in favor of this motion, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion passes. And I'm guessing that Mr. Munoz want to talk about retirements. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, this meeting we are recognizing uh, a few teacher retirements. The first one is uh, Deborah Muey. She's a teacher for the developmental disabled uh, at Elton Hills Elementary School, retirement at the end of uh, July. She has 38 years in the district. Next is Kim Pickett, kindergarten teacher at Falwell Elementary, 20 years. David Pugh, math teacher at the Rochester Alternative Learning Center, 18 years. Christy Lee Sprinkle, psychologist at John Marshall High School, 11 years. Sandra Wells, uh, social studies teacher at Century High School for 32 years. And then we have paraprofessionals, uh, Cheryl Holyfield, special ed para at Fredell Middle School, 16 years. Pamela Lee, special education paraprofessional at Gage Elementary, 20 years. And Pamela McDeer. McAteer Elementary Para at, in the library at Hoover, 20 years. So we want to thank all of those individuals for uh, their service to the district. Thank you. 5.01, uh, CTEC presentation. This is an information item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm going to call uh, Janie Gibson and Brandon. Uh, we had Brandon uh, give the uh, administrator and leadership an update on CTEC, and after hearing that presentation, said, you know what, this would probably be good for the board and the community to hear where we are. Uh, we just completed our second full year. Uh, well, I guess not officially yet. We still have another day, but... <laughs> not at CTEC. Oh, well, we are officially done at CTEC, so we have finished two full years at CTEC. allowing me to come in and present this. It, um, it has been a productive and exciting year at CTEC, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to share with you uh, some of the things that we have been working on, some of the things that we are still working on um, as we continue to promote career and college readiness for the students of, of Rochester Public Schools. So what did I do? There we go. OK. And I. Um, I'll apologize, there's a little bit of a formatting issue when you go from Google Slides to PowerPoint, so um, a few of these are, are a little bit um, off-center there. But just as a quick reminder, these are the 10 um, career pathways that we highlight uh, in our registration guide and in our course offerings for students of, of Rochester Public Schools. Um, not all 10 of these are housed at CTEC, um, but in my work with uh, career and technical education, I do support the work that uh, our instructors do in, in each of these 10 pathways. So what we have been working on this year at CTEC, and this is just a few of the highlights. Um, this is something that has come to fruition uh, over the course of the year. This actually started as a conversation between Superintendent Munoz and a representative from McKinstry Engineering. McKinstry Engineering um, was originally um, founded in the Pacific Northwest. They have expanded to the Midwest, including Minneapolis, and a gentleman by the name of Ed Zapita um, approached us, and he and I have been speaking over the past several months, and we have now um, selected the first cohort of, of incoming juniors, so sophomores who will be juniors next year, who have uh, submitted an application and been selected for a two-year apprenticeship program with McKinstry Engineering. Um, they will uh, come to CTEC one day a week. McKinstry is sending engineers down from the Twin Cities at no cost to the district. And during the student's junior year, they will explore everything that there is um, to explore in engineering, safety in the workplace. Um, McKinstry has a couple of projects that I, um, I probably shouldn't mention publicly that are not official yet, but uh, in the city of Rochester. So uh, we're hopeful that our students will be able to go onto job sites and, and see the work in action. And then at the end of their junior year, they will actually complete energy audits on RPS um, school sites in conjunction with McKinstry engineers. And when they come back as a senior in that cohort, they will select a school and they will actually put together um, a, a presentation for you, the school board, um, looking at um, project management, carrying out that project, uh, evaluating the project, and then again their capstone will be uh, as a group making a presentation to you on 
how they can improve or how they propose to improve the energy efficiency of a particular school building in, in, in our district. So originally, we had agreed on three to five students district-wide. We had 12 students that applied, and McKinstry agreed to take all 12 and run two cohorts in the, in the first year. So we're, we're excited about that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Bartus was here earlier uh, talking about computer science and information technology, and uh, we're going to be introducing two new concurrent enrollment classes with RCTC. So students will, um, at the start of next year, be able to earn both high school and college credit in information technology. We'll be interesting a web app design class in, during the 18-19 school year, and that will alternate every other year with a web design in JavaScript. Um, and those classes we had, I think we proposed four options to mm -hmm. our students, and those were the two that, based on survey feedback, they, they were the most interested in. So um, we're excited to introdu introduce those starting next year. Uh, this is one that is currently in the works. I am working with um, Principal Bergerson, uh, as well as Jessica Marquardt, the Community Schools Coordinator, um, and some business and industry partners to create a collaboration between CTEC and Gage Elementary. Um, our tentative plan is to connect each grade level at Gage with a pathway at CTEC and build, um, through their community schools dollars, build curriculum kits, some manipulative, manipulatives that students can interact with in their classroom. Um, I have, right now, I believe seven or eight um, businesses in the city of Rochester within those pathways that have committed to being guest speakers, um, inviting elementary students from Gage for field trips, and then we're also going to look into having um, CTEC instructors and students go to Gage and work with those students within that career pathway. So um, we're pretty excited about, about that. When I, Just as an aside, when I shared this slide at the leadership event in May, I had at least three other elementary principals email me immediately <laughs> saying, how do we get in on that? And I said, well, let us try it at Gage first, and then we'll... We'll look at replicating that based on based on its success. Randy, so. can I ask you a question about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So that every child will get exposed to all of those sometime between kindergarten and fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, and and I'll share with you where this was born. Um, and and Nikki Bergerson, the principal at Gage, shared this with me when she was at John Marshall. And this was you know in in the early stages, obviously, of of CTEC. She worked primarily with ninth graders, and when they would come in and she would talk to them about career pathways in CTEC, they would kind of look at her and go, what? Yeah. And so when she transitioned to Gage, she told herself one of the things she was going to ensure was that when students left Gage in fifth grade, they knew about the career opportunities that, that existed in, in our community and in our region. So she really deserves all the, all the credit for this one. Happy to talk to your first graders as a computer science engineer. That'd be great. That'd be great. I don't want to eat what the kindergartners are making, but um, <laughs> so, no, you know, I, I love this because kids don't know that they're passionate about something unless they know that thing exists. Correct. And I think even at this very young age, this is awesome. Without the, telling kids they have to choose who right. you're going to be or what you're going to do, just saying, look at all the possibilities. Absolutely. And the, the way that we selected the pathway for the grade level was somewhat based on natural curriculum fit. Mm -hmm. So we had conversations about some curricular units that, that currently exist in that grade level. Um, and then we obviously made some decisions based on age of the student. Um, manufacturing would be the example there. We wanted to make sure we had our oldest students, if they were going to be coming out to CTEC, to spend some time in the manufacturing lab. So. We continue to have a, a, an amazing partnership with, with the Mayo Clinic, and uh, we're looking to expand that and have a specific partnership with the Pharmacy Technician Program within the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences. Mayo Clinic just this summer is going to be introducing a 21-week um, certification program in um, Pharmacy Technician. Even I had no idea how many pharmacies exist at the Mayo Clinic here in Rochester and the number of different departments that have their own pharmacy. And we currently offer a pharmacy tech class at CTEC. And what we're envisioning is um, the Mayo Clinic is actually going to be writing their own nationwide curriculum for their 21-week program. And they have agreed to give us that curriculum for free. Um, and we would align what we're teaching 
in our, our class at CTEC so that students could transition seamlessly directly into that 21-week um, program. We're looking at, uh, obviously, collaboration between the instructors in the Mayo um, School of Health Sciences program and at CTEC. And then also the potential for um, our students to receive uh, preferred admission into that program if they've successfully completed um, our class. And there are some conversations about if students take our class and transition and they successfully complete that, that perhaps there would be some um, incentive for tuition reimbursement for the cost of that program. So continue to look at ways that we can expand our partnership with, with Mayo Clinic. They're a, they're a phenomenal, phenomenal partner for us. Construction trades, um, and I read this slide about 20 minutes before the board meeting started, and uh, the, the first bullet there says, currently completing work on a shed at Mayo High School. They have completed that work, um, so they went over there for a couple of weeks at the end of the year here, and that's a project that's I think they've worked on over the course of two years. So they went on site at Mayo High School and, and um, built and finished a, a shed out near, um, out near their track. We are in conversation with uh, Family Services Rochester. If you're familiar with the playhouses that get built on an annual basis and then they are up for raffle at Rochester Fest, uh, we have been contacted by Family Service Rochester and asked if our Construction Trades 1 and 2 class would be interested in building one of those next year. Um, so we're in conversation about that. I think it would be a great opportunity for our students to um, learn the skills but then also see that that value of giving back to the community um, while doing so and in October we'll actually be holding our second annual construct tomorrow uh, it's a construction and building trades fair that will be hosted at Century High School um, last year I'm gonna try and get my numbers correct I think we had uh, 400 students from 12 districts um, across southeastern Minnesota came and Transportation was completely covered by a, a business partner that we work with, um, and we had um, contractors there, we had uh, engineers there, we had uh, building trades there. It was, a, it was a really neat experience, and we're looking to make it a little bit bigger and a little bit better this year as well. Our culinary consortium, uh, this again is a, a work in progress. Um, kind of highlights one of the partnerships we have with RCTC. RCTC does not currently have a culinary program, but they're looking at starting one. And we are kind of getting in on the ground floor of that, and we're looking to build a pathway that would lead from CTEC and our culinary classes into RCTC's program, and then it would articulate to the four-year culinary program at UW-Stout. Um, and if you're not familiar, UW-Stout is nationally known for their, their culinary education program. So we're excited about that. Um, the way that would start is students that are enrolled in that RCTC program would get paid for 40 hours every week. 20 hours of those would be working with a culinary partner in the community, and 20 hours they'd be in the classroom continuing to build their skills. So they're getting paid to learn. Um, so really a, a neat opportunity that we foresee coming in the future for our culinary students. Um, many, many conversations on this one. Um, and I believe that uh, there's a, an agenda item that was added, 5.02. <laughs> so um, Superintendent Munoz and, and um, I don't know Janie. How to, Janie, okay. <laughs> there was like five different titles going around in my head there. And, and Janie and I have been working with um, the superintendent, uh, principal, and a, a member of their curriculum team from Dover Yoda, as well as um, the legal representation from both districts and our um, local EA leadership to create um, kind of a... a a teacher exchange slash tuition agreement. So I know when CTEC was first um, built and those conversations were starting, the, the dream for that was that it would be a regional center for career and technical education, and, and I think this is a, a possible first step in that direction. So the agreement that you're going to be looking at um, in the next agenda mm -hmm. item lays out the parameters for a Dover Yoda teacher to be able to come to CTEC and teach a class. Um, and that's why it's, it's important for you to understand we did work with our, our local EA leadership. They would not take any FTEs away from RPS teachers. It would be a, an available FTE 
or perhaps a class that we don't currently offer it at CTEC that Dover Yoda has an instructor for. Um, and in exchange for that FTE, we would open up seats at CTEC for Dover Yoda students. Now, uh, if you don't know, Dover Yoda High School is 11 miles away from CTEC. Uh, and by bus, they can get to us faster than our John Marshall students, just because they don't have to go through town. So um, next year, what we're looking at, if, if uh, this agreement is approved by both school boards, we don't have that teacher exchange in place. It just didn't work out with staffing and the courses. So the other part of that agreement is a tuition agreement where we would still allow Dover Yoda students to come and take classes at CTEC for an agreed upon um, tuition amount. Um, the, the positive for both districts is there are achievement and integration dollars that, that come with this agreement because we're truly integrating our students and teaching classes um, with instructors from both districts as well as students. Uh, and that those dollars can be used to offset uh, transportation costs. Not just transportation costs for Dover Yoda, but our transportation costs as well from our three comprehensive high schools as well as the ALC out to, to CTEC. So um, hoping that you'll agree that this is exciting as, as we think it is, um, because it would be great to, uh, to really open up the, the opportunities that we have at CTEC to students outside of RPS as well. This is, uh, I think we're one conversation into, into this item, uh, and this came out actually out of uh, the, the school district being named uh, an RST first district, if I'm getting that, that title correctly, um, with the Rochester International Airport. Um, at the same time that that was happening, I was contacted by uh, the CEO of Great Plains Aviation. They are a flight school uh, here in Rochester. And they were interested in talking with us about a summer camp for students interested in aviation. Um, at the same time, RCTC announced that they were starting an aviation program um, in, their, uh, in their facility, as well as uh, a couple of um, very uh, in inventive folks at Lincoln K-8 who are going to be introducing drones to their students uh, within their mm -hmm. curriculum and, and programming. So we all got together and started talking about what it might look like for us to um, introduce uh, an aviation pathway um, for our students to go from learning about drones in, in middle school to uh, an introduction to aviation at SeaTech, perhaps into RCTC's program and then into the workforce um, needs that we have uh, here. And again, before that meeting I had no idea the workforce needs that exist in, in aviation. Literally hundreds of thousands of pilots will be needed across our nation within the next five to ten years just based on the age of, of current pilots and the retirement rate so um, we're excited about continuing that conversation to see to see where that might lead us as as part of our Perkins our federal Perkins grant application that we submit every year we are required to administer technical skill assessments for our students within our career pathways it gives us feedback on how students are doing, what they're learning within those career pathways. And historically, those TSAs, as they're referred to, have been, I would say, more traditional standardized assessments, um, paper, pencil. Uh, some of them are online. We have really tried to transition this year, moving into next year, to industry-recognized certifications for our students. So not only do we meet those requirements for our technical skill assessments, but our students walk out of the classroom with a certificate that's industry recognized that they can put on a resume that they can take into an interview. So you see here the three that we're really looking at starting with within our culinary. Um, Serve Safe is an industry standard. Um, right now, Minnesota state law requires every production kitchen to have one Serve Safe certified employee. Um, the Kaler Group, for instance, in Rochester, they're moving towards every person that works in a kitchen in their in their organization will, will need to be serve safe certified so we're going to be introducing that next year and our students will be prepared and ready to take the serve safe examination when they when they complete their coursework in automotive um, ASE certification they have a student level which allows us for a, a very reasonable fee to um, make available to our students I think it's two dozen different certifications within automotive that they can they can take and then again walk out with that certificate and, and take it to a job interview. And in construction, we're looking at the OSHA 10-hour certification. So those occupational safety and hazard um, pieces. There's a 
there's a 10 hour, there's a 30 hour, there's a 40 hour. 10 hour is what we can reasonably get in um, into our, our curriculum as it exists. So we're, we're really looking towards moving that, moving that direction for those industry recognized certifications for our students. Brandon, can I ask you a question about that Absolutely. too? Absolutely. You sort of alluded to this when you were talking about the automotive thing, but to get these certifications, um, do the students pay the fee or is that included with the, they don't pay? No, we're going we're gonna to pay for those at least to start out of the Perkins grant. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This slide just, uh, when, when I, uh, when I took this position, Erin Broviak, the, the person that was previously in this position, one of the things she told me is, you're going to do a lot of tours. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, it's year two. Those will die down. No, nope, they didn't die down at all. We're, we're still giving tours on a, on a weekly basis. And this is just a sample of, of some of the groups that have come through. I want to specifically point out um, a couple um, on, in the right-hand column there, Minnetonka Public Schools. If you're familiar, Minnetonka Public Schools for, I don't know, 15 years perhaps has run a, a tour of their district that folks from all across the state sign up and pay to go to. Um, and they reached out to us because they wanted to come and see our facility uh, and specifically our health sciences facility because they're looking to replicate what we have done here in Rochester. Same goes for La Crosse Public Schools. We had representatives from La Crosse as well as the uh, Wisconsin Western Technical College that came together in hopes to replicate the partnership and the collaboration that we have as well as the facility and one that is currently ongoing and um, have really have Don Sapala from from Grauk to thank for this one Minneapolis Public Schools is partnering with Metropolitan State University and I believe Minneapolis Technical and Community College and we're currently working on finding a date for them to come down either this summer or in the fall so that they can take a look at our facility and, and try to replicate the success that, that we're having. So lots to be proud of, of, of the work that was done for years, um, putting CTEC together and, and making sure that the curriculum and the facilities um, and that we have the right instructors there. So I just wanted to point a couple of those out. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Um, I've talked about a few of them here and there. I do want to um, point out real quickly the, the Pace Dairy. I had the opportunity earlier this fall to go and tour Pace Dairy as part of uh, Minnesota Manufacturers Week. Um, and I couldn't have told you what Pace Dairy did before I went there. I had no idea that they were a Kroger affiliate, no idea that they processed cheese that you can't get within like five hours of, of Rochester. Um, but I just went back last week with a couple of our instructors from CTEC and we are working on a partnership that will cross agriculture, manufacturing, culinary, and health sciences. I believe it'll be the first partnership that we have that crosses more than one pathway and certainly one that, that crosses four. Um, they're very excited to work with us and, uh, and our instructors are, are excited to work with them as well. So lots of great partners. This is just a sample of, of those that we work with. Yeah, I would add, I think uh, CTEC rather quickly has become very well known across the state of Minnesota. Uh, actually, I spent the morning in uh, Owatonna on a panel for the, uh, the state of manufacturing. So uh, there was a lot of interest with manufacturers there on how we have what we did and the partnerships we have. And I know Brandon's going to do another one of these yep. coming up uh, as well. So. Uh, not only are we having a lot of people coming to tour and learn about it, every, everywhere I go, they know about CTEC. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, we started out with seven pathways, we're at 10. Uh, sometime here in the near future, we're gonna bring uh, some information to you. We're looking at an entrepreneur program. Uh, we're probably two years out for that one. Uh, we're in conversation with some individuals that potentially having that classroom uh, downtown where they can interact with, um, other adult entrepreneurs. So uh, we continue to try to provide opportunities for our students and because Rochester is, is uh, really good at partnering with our school district, it makes that work much easier. But, you know, I think uh, I agree. At year two, you think, well, this touring thing would kind of die down, but y you it realize that it's not. And I, I anticipate it's not gonna slow down any next no. year either. 
Thank you. Ms. Becker. So do you feel that the pathways that, that we created early on, that those were the right ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that they evolve. Um, you know, one example, it, I would say, is agriculture. We have far greater interest in um, the veterinary science side of agriculture than maybe we anticipated, um, and probably less interest in the production agriculture side of that pathway than, than we might have anticipated. Um, but the, the great thing about our instructors and our, our business and industry partners is they're flexible with, with that as well. Um, we recently had a, a meeting with the, um, the phlebotomy department at, at the Mayo Clinic to talk about the potential needs there because um, we were hearing perhaps there might be a desire to create a partnership and you know as things turned out it, the need wasn't there but it was great to have those conversations and understand how we can support them through what we're, we're currently doing so um, I, I can't think of a pathway that I would say at this time you know we missed on that one um, but they're definitely evolving as we you know as our students change and, and as the employment needs change. Did you talk about your advisory board too that you have? Yes, yes. So we did, uh, we did establish an advisory committee this year for CTEC. Um, we have um, Director Smith is, is our school board representative on there, and then the rest of that is business and industry. So we have uh, an executive from Crenlo. We have um, Guy Finney from Mayo Clinic, uh, Don Sapala from, from Grouk. We have um, Rochester Area Builders. We have an executive from Halcon, so it's all business and industry folks. We tried to get representation from each of our, our pathways on that committee, and we meet twice a year. Um, I share with them a lot of these same updates, uh, enrollment updates, and um, they, they share a lot of information with me from, from their field, their experience on, on where the needs are, what things we can be working on with our students in class from a, an employability standpoint. Um, to ensure that our students are career and college ready when they leave. So how are the numbers? So this year unduplicated at CTEC we're just over 500 students um, that took a you know any class at, at CTEC. Um, next year that number is going to go up. We're adding um, one section in information technology. We're adding two sections in um, culinary arts. We're adding a second level of veterinary studies class. Um, our numbers in manufacturing are, are up. Uh, we're going to have large <laughs> welding and, and large welding classes. Um, so I anticipate that number will, will rise even more. When we look at the number of students that are taking a CTE class in our high schools system-wide, it's um, probably, yeah, I think we were, the last time we checked it was 1,600. I think maybe we're up to 1,800 students that have that are taking a CTE class so um, so how um, um, so are counselors you know talking more about you know about you know, about CTEC and and how are we kind of working I mean our own students pipeline into this if they want to or at least exposing them I, I obviously gauge is one way yes Yes, um, if, <clears throat> when I go back here, um, I saw had, there were some other yeah, yeah. schools. Absolutely, had had a number of middle school groups that have come out to look at the facility. Primarily, Is it the students come too. Mm -hmm. Yes, so like a yep. field trip for them. Yeah, okay. primarily um, eighth grade students okay. that are you okay. know seventh Good. or eighth grade. They're getting ready to think about what they might want to take when they're when they're in high school. Um, we have. Um, new students to the ALC. We bring them, them out uh, quarterly, so they come out and see the facilities. I work closely with our, our counselors um, and our registrars um, in, in looking at uh, the courses that are available for our students. So um, definitely continuing to work on ensuring that our students are aware of the opportunities that they have right here in in our and district. word of mouth from the students that participate yeah. out there is huge. And, you okay. know, they go back to their sites and they start talking about it, and that has really made a big difference for us as well. Okay. I just have one more. This will be quick. Did you charge Minnetonka? No. <laughs> no. Come on. Sure. No. Yeah. 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 Missed opportunity. Yes. 
I, I will share, we did, a, we did a student survey halfway through the year, and we just simply asked our students, what, what do you like most about being at CTEC, and what could we do to improve your experience at CTEC? And the overwhelming theme and what do you like most is um, you treat us like adults. Mm -hmm. And that's really something that we've focused on uh, is all of our conversations center around career and college readiness. So talking to students about, you know, if we have a concern about behavior or attendance or academics, we talk about what that would look like if they were at the post-secondary level or what that conversation would be if they were in the workplace. So that was really good feedback for us, that that's coming through to our students. And the number one theme of what we could do to improve was to get a vending machine. <laughs> so we thought, you know, we're doing pretty good if, if that's the worst thing about CTEC is that we don't have a vending machine. So. Other questions? Our next agenda item, thank you, is 5.02, um, but that's approving the Dover Yoda collaboration, right? Yes. Which you sort of uh, already. Did, yeah, we weren't going to uh, do a formal presentation if there's any questions you have. I mean, Brandon kind of touched on it right. during uh, his presentation, but if you have any specific questions about the agreement, we, as he mentioned, uh, we worked with both teachers unions. We wanted to make sure there were no issues there. Our attorney reviewed it, their attorney reviewed it, and, and both agreed with what we're bringing forward uh, is acceptable um, for both sides. Ms. Sealinger. Do we have, and it might be in here, so forgive me if it is, I'm trying to read quickly, uh, a number of students that we would accept, or do we have any limits or expectations? Uh, let me open it up. I think if I'm correct here, I think this next year they're only having 10 students that are starting. And, you know, the conversation I had with, with uh, their superintendent is, that, you know, we're not, we're not doing this to, to make money. Mm -hmm. But it, as your students come and, and, you know, we have to open another section, then you're going to have to pay for that or provide a, a teacher to help us cover that. So it's really not intended to, as a moneymaker, but giving other kids in Southeast Minnesota an opportunity as long as it's not an additional cost to the district. And is this the kind of thing that we can do sort of one year at a time? Yep. Okay. Our hope is that this will go well and the word will get out and we'll have other districts that will have an interest in, in sending students uh, to CTEC as well. And I'm assuming that's because we want to begin this with them next year, it would be next school year, it would be better to come to an agreement sooner rather yeah, than later. Yeah, it would be greatly appreciated, but I mean, if you want to let it sit till next meeting, that's fine. But uh, the sooner we can get it approved and they approve it on their end, uh, we can move forward. Anyone? No one? Okay, thank you. 7.01 approval uh, bids and related processes for student nutrition services. This is a briefing item. Yes, I'm going to call Amy Ike, Executive Director of Community Education. And are you coming? <laughs> I think Sherry and. Are you guys coming up? Yep. All right. I didn't know for sure. You're not on my. Sh you're not on my sheets. I wasn't for sure. Oh, you're on the next page. <laughs> I could tell you all about it, but <laughs> I think they'll do a better job for you. So, as they're getting set up, good evening, board members, uh, Chair Marvin, Mr. Munoz. Uh, we have actually several items right in a row, so if it's okay with you, we'll just keep going there one after another. This is the time of year, every year, that we bring these forward to you to uh, update our uh, plans for next year's student nutrition services. So I will turn it over to Sherry, and we'll field your questions along the way. So the first one is we, good evening. Um, we're um, asking for your approval to continue to purchase next year um, our food products under the National Joint Powers Alliance um, agreement. Um, this is the first year that we were able to purchase our food items through this 
um, state and federal approved um, group. Um, they are, um, if a school district's if a school district belongs to the NJPA, then you're able to purchase your food products or other entities um, under this umbrella, such as playground equipment, um, food, um, paper supplies, that type of thing. Um, it was a, a learning year for us. I will actually have to say that it went well. We were able to purchase from um, um, Upper Lakes Foods, and they are one of the two um, food distributors that was approved through the multi-unit group, which is a part of the um, NJPA. They are a local Minnesota company, and we had um, been able to purchase from Upper Lakes Foods in previous years. So this year is being um, somewhat um, of a major vendor. Um, we had established relationships, and it went really quite well. So we're asking for a, your approval to continue to purchase under the NJPA contract with Upper Lake Foods for next year. Also, we are asking for um, approval for uh, milk and bread bids. Um, this is the third year. Um, we did get approval in the 14-15 year school year to, for a three-year concept to purchase um, bread and milk from these two vendors listed here from Kemp's and from um, Sara Lee. So this year we just had to um, solicit pricing if there were pricing changes from both Kemp's and um, Sara Lee and those that information was provided for you in the attachments. Question? Oh, yes. So being the first year, do you feel there was a cost savings associated with this agreement that we were able to benefit from? Yes. We had anticipated that going into the agreement that we would save roughly 2% um, of our food dollars with this agreement. And we really felt, because of their competitive buying power, that we've been able to do that. We've actually purchased, um, for a, a bulk dollar amount, less this year than we did in the 16-17 school year. And that's 2% of, I, I don't know your total budget at all. Um, well, we actually, um, last year we asked for approval for 2.6 million. This year we're asking for 2.8 million. So um, last year approval was for the 2.6 that we had done some homework that we would be able to save 2% 2, 2 from the previous year. That's a pretty significant year. savings. Yes. Yes. Um, I love to hear that this is, uh, that that worked and that uh, hopefully that made your job easier. Um, although whatever you do, you make it look easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to move this to action. Okay, it's um, been moved to action. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of moving this to action, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby authorize student nutrition services to purchase food products from Upper Lakes Foods, Cloquet, Minnesota through the multi-unit group National Joint Powers Alliance contract for the 2018-2019 fiscal year to be funded from the student nutrition services budget and be it further resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the pricing from Kemp's LLC of Rochester, Minnesota in the approximate amount of $387,390.94. Uh, $387, That's approximate. Um, for the purchase of milk and milk products for all schools for the 2018-2019 fiscal year to be funded from the Student Nutrition Services budget and be it further resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the pricing from Sarah Lee of Egan, Minnesota in the approximate amount of $59,682,000 for the purchase of $59,682, sorry, for the purchase of bread and bread products for all schools for the 2018-2019 fiscal year to be funded from the 2018-2019 Student Nutrition Services budget. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you.
and then we're on to 7.02 acceptance of proposals for fresh produce for the 2018-2019 school year another briefing item yes. yes good evening so this is a new proposal that we are bringing to you this evening um, there are some new procurement guidelines that school nutrition programs um, have to follow that were just recently updated and with those updates any schools that um, purchase over a hundred thousand dollars annually on fresh produce we're highly encouraged to go out for proposals for these purchases so we um, sent out proposals and we received two proposals back um, with these proposals we did ask for market basket pricing and for fixed price um, on a number of different items and tonight we are here asking for approval to um, purchase from Vic's Produce Company for the 18-19 school year. Yes, Ms. Selinger. Um, I have a question, um, and I b believe you've worked with Vic's before. How does this uh, have any, it, maybe it has no bearing on being able to work with like any local uh, farmers or providers? Mm -hmm. So a great question. Actually, that was part of the proposal is um, working with local providers. And so um, part of the proposal asked that they would showcase um, how they work with local providers and how they would um, advertise that or promote that to different schools so that we would know that we are purchasing local products so that we can pass that on to our schools and to the students. Go ahead. So just for clarity, it, we would be can purchasing locally, but it wouldn't be as if you're going out to CCAP to Absolutely. buy apples. It would come, exactly. Vicks would buy from CCAP and it might come to it or whoever. Yeah, and that's exactly how it goes. Due to the volume that we need sure. here in Rochester Public Schools, it's hard for um, local farmers to be able to produce that volume for us. And due to some um, food safety guidelines um, that Olmsted County kind of pro are kind of watches for us, they recommend that that's the process that we follow. Other questions? Again, this is a briefing item, which could be moved to action. I'll move this to action. <laughs> and moved and seconded to make this an action item. Any discussion? And no pressure there. Um, <laughs> any discussion? All in favor of moving this to action, say aye. 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 Opposed? Be it resolved that School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the proposal from Bix Produce Company of St. Paul, Minnesota in the estimated amount of $325,000 for the purchase of fresh produce for the Student Nutrition Services Department for the 2018-2019 school year. Move approval. Okay. And moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. 7.03 acceptance of bid for paper products for the student nutrition services department for the 2018 2019 school year this is a briefing item and this paper products is it's always a real people pleaser isn't it <laughs> <laughs> okay. we're all about napkins yeah <laughs> <laughs> so this one is is um, pretty simple we um, advertised um, our paper needs, um, it w they were sent out to five vendors and advertised in the Post Bulletin and the district website. Um, we only received one bid um, back. Um, I'm guessing you may wonder why we only received one. Um, it, it just seems that in the state of Minnesota, um, restaurant supplies for paper needs, plastic needs is, is somewhat um, selective and so there seems to be very few companies that um, offer these types of products out. We also, in our um, bid specifications, we asked that the company that would be approved and awarded would be able to supply the majority of the products to the district. So we would be putting all our eggs in one basket, per se, rather than um, trying to buy a little here and a little there and a little um, elsewhere. And so um, this is a, a fairly well-known um, company to the state of Minnesota for restaurant supply and school needs. Could you just speak briefly in our um, cafeterias, do students have paper plates or do they have trays or? The majority of the schools right now 
um, have plastic trays. Mm -hmm. There are a number of elementary schools that still do not have dishwashers, and so we are limited to using some type of a disposable product there. Um, we have been able in the last few years as we've um, sought support with the district um, in their remodeling efforts to update the school kitchens that we are putting in dish rooms and dishwashers in all of the remodels. Hoover, for example, has not had a um, dish room or a dishwasher, and in the remodel, they will get a new dishwasher. Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. have an approximate cost of what that costs at an elementary school not to have that dish room? Not to have the dish room? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, obviously, we would have to look. We would have to look at the individual site and the participation. Mm -hmm that we have at that site and what the cost of the tray is and look at that. And then, because we've actually looked at those studies to compare um, as we've added in a dish room in an elementary school, what is the cost of not only the dish machine right. but also the chemicals, mm -hmm. the labor, those other costs that are associated with putting in um, that piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And we've always seen that it wins over, that we're that it's the best decision to put in the dishwasher. And for the long term. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, again, this is another briefing item, and there's been one bid. I'll move to action. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? This is an action item. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the bid from Trio Supply Company of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the estimated amount of $156,073 for the purchase of paper products for the Student Nutrition Services Department for the 2018-2019 school year. Approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And that brings us to 7.04, approval of credit card processing services for student nutrition services. Again, a briefing item. So um, today we are asking for approval for the credit card processing. So currently, um, student nutrition services um, works with PayPams to process credit card payments um, so that students can use for their um, school breakfast and school lunch. We are in the final year of this um, contract, so we went out for um, bids to um, do credit card processing again. And after looking um, at the rubric that we developed um, from the proposals, we are um, asking for approval to um, continue with PayPams um, for moving forward for the 18-19 school year. You, you say 18, 19, but I see in here it says it's for a four-year period beginning July 2018. Yep, so it'll be um, 18, 19 will be the first year of this, the and then four. we'll be able to renew for the but additional. Was the last one a four-year? Um, yes. yes, it was. And just to clarify, just for, I think, general information, kids, when they go through the lunch line, don't have an actual credit card. No. They do not. Nope. So this is where parents actually um, have a login that they can log into their student's um, account and um, basically put money into those accounts. Um, so some parents can, uh, when they are at like $10, they can get reminders to put more money into their account. So it's something so that we don't have to have cash or checks in the schools. Great. As a parent, I use it. It's actually a very easy service to use. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and, and I would also like to point out and re reiterate, which I think I did last year, been here so long. Um, maybe not. Um, so, so the district is really picking up the cost yes. of those credit card fees. Um, and, and I think that's really a benefit to parents um, to not have to think about, you know, it's going to be $20 plus 3.8% or whatever. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, you deserve some thanks and credit for um, believing that that's the right thing to do for our families. Um, and uh, I, I agree with Mark, it's, it's a very easy system. It's very, 
My son did ask me the other day if I thought he used up a lot of PayPal money during the year, which made me kind of suspicious, but I decided <laughs> it's too late in the year. I'm not going to look at what he's been eating, so we're just going to let that one go. Um, so, uh, you know, thanks for bringing this to the district, and um, I, I, I really was was glad to see that it was PayPal's was staying because I didn't want to have to learn a new <laughs> no. system. So, no, so it's, it's, all, it's all game. good. Yeah. It's all good for us, <laughs> for us parents. I did have one more question. It's not directly related to this, but now we're at the end of the school year. How much unfunded school funds did we have this year? Do you approximately know? Do you mean unpaid balances? Unpaid balances. Do you know where we stand? Mm, I, I think we're at about thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand right for now. the for the year, right? Mm, there will be some of of the revenue coming in yet with sure. some of the procedures that that will be enacted now in the next week or two. But um, I think right now we're ab about that figure. Mm -hmm. Where does that? Well, it's lower it, than last year. Is it high, low, medium? What's it kind of? It's lower than last year, yes. Mm -hmm. But higher than it has been in the past? No, I, I honestly, we have been working really hard um, trying to find different um, venues to communicate with parents as to um, how they can work with us to pay their negative lunch balances. This was the first year that USDA required all school districts um, across the nation to instill some type of negative balance procedures or school board policy actually. And so that information, those, that procedure information was sent um, to all families in the district at the beginning of the school year. So I think just in the quest of trying to communicate better and letting families know that there are procedures that are coming behind a negative balance. And as a district, we continue to make sure that all students are fed yes. negative balance or not, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. Let me just say on a personal uh, level, my uh, six-year-old grandson who's in kindergarten continues to believe that the best thing about school is school lunch <laughs> every day. He has school lunch every day. And I get the load on exactly what it was and how delicious it was. He also likes the bus ride, though. But he likes, he likes school lunch better. So thank you. Thank you. For that. Yes. I'd like to move this to action. And move to action. I'll second. And second it. Any discussion? All those in favor of moving this to action, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's an action item. Be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby select pay PAMS for student nutrition credit card processing services for a four-year period beginning July 2018 through June 2022. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We need discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you so much. Seven point oh five results of the twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen district wide radon testing briefing item. Yes, at this time I'm gonna call Scott Sheridan, Executive Director of Operations, and then Mike Stock, Coordinator of Health and Safety, will join him to brief us on the next two items. Good evening, board members. Good evening, Scott. I'm here to, uh, this is just an information item that I'm going to brief you on. Uh, this is on the radon testing that results from 2017 and 2018 district wide. Um, we have a, we voluntarily test for radon, but uh, we've also adopted a radon test or a plan that tests one fifth of the buildings every year so that we stay in line with every building's tested every five years. And uh, Minnesota statutes allows us to use long-term facility maintenance revenue because we do get our 10-year plan approved by the school board and approved by MDE. And because we do that, we are allowed to use our health and safety funds out of LTFMR to pay for the radon testing. Um, the statute also says that we have to report the results of the testing to the Minnesota Department of Health, which Mike does regularly. And then we report, report the results to the school board. So that's what we're here doing tonight. Uh, we provided you an attachment. Of, it's a very large attachment of um, 
the past uh, two years testings that we've been doing. Um, we utilize IEA to do our, our testing, and if you have specific questions about uh, the depth and how that's occurred, Mike is here to answer those questions. But um, MDH sets a level of 4.0 pickle curies per liter, and anything uh, above 4.0 is an actionable level. And on May 2nd, 2017, we received the results for those uh, seven sites that, you, that we've reported on. Three of them, Jefferson, Edison, and Northrop actually had some actionable levels above the 4.0 pickle curies. And we've taken uh, remediation. We hired Athlon Radon Services to come in and they did uh, the mitigation services doing some uh, sub-slab depressurization and those systems are in place, they're constantly running, and uh, the supplemental tests afterwards show that the pickle curies are well below the actionable level now in those, those areas. Uh, also in 2018, we did some long-term testing as well at the, those si the six elementary schools, and the results of those showed no actionable levels at any of those sites. And, and Mike can speak for this, that we, I believe that we tested the sites that we thought potentially might be uh, problematic from the results from 12 and 2012 and 13 first, because we wanted to get right on top of those right away, and that's why we chose those first uh, seven schools or sites uh, to test back in 17, and the results have obviously improved there, and then in 18, we didn't have any issues at all. So uh, the results of this, like I said, is just an information item reporting to the school board. I, just, I have two quick questions. Um, I'm so glad we're doing this. I mean, I know radon is an issue everywhere in this this area, so I think it's really important. The sub-slab depressurization system, is that a big deal to do, and is it expensive? It depends. Well, Mike, I'll let you talk about it. Well, I'm not questioning. I mean, well, clearly, whatever it is, it's something we have to do, but I'm just wondering for information's sake. <clears throat> As Scott mentioned, we, we hired Athlon Services to, to do the remediation. <clears throat> and what they do is it, they study the building, the foundation, the structure, and they decide on points where they feel would take the pressure off um, some of the underground. Basically what it is, it's a natural gas that forms below slabs, especially in this part of the state, and can collect and then it looks for cracks or seams or things to release into your building. So they'll take the structure, they actually gathered um, prints from our construction services department, were able to look at footings in, in some of the crawl spaces and determine areas to do some small bores where they actually add uh, PVC piping and then they have a continuous ventilation fan that runs 24 seven and exhausts that out of doors. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Information item, thank yes. you. And from Radon, we're on to approval of lead in water management plan for Rochester Public Schools. Good evening, board members. This is uh, a briefing item on the approval of our lead in water management plan that we have created. Minnesota statute requires that we, uh, public school buildings that serve pre-K through 12, have a lead in water uh, water source. They have to test their water sources every five years. And the updated statute says that each school district must adopt the, either the commissioner's model plan or create our own that uh, follows what the commission, commissioner's plan is and have that adopted by the school board prior to July 1st of 2018. So we, what we did is Mike, along with some uh, assistance with input from the facility staff, created a pretty comprehensive lead and water management plan for the district. Uh, I do want to point out that the actionable levels that Minnesota Department of Health has in their plan is at 20 parts per billion of lead. We, or Mike, has always, uh, we always take actionable levels at 15, and we've used that standard for, as, I believe, as long as Mike has been here. Uh, and so we, we have a more restrictive policy than what Minnesota Department of Health has uh, recommended. One of the changes that came through uh, Minnesota Department of Health is they now have created uh, some options for 
doing some lead mitigation from two parts per billion to 20 parts per billion. But like I said, we're already at 15 where we're actionable. So we had to create our plan that we were going to do some, we had some options to do some lead mitigation from two to 15 parts per billion. And uh, we're going to utilize what the Minnesota Department of Health and the uh, commissioner's model plan was uh, to take into effect. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to reduce everything down below two unless the board directs us that they want us to do that. Uh, we're bringing this in information forward to you for you to review and if you have ideas that you want changed in here or other right, or actionable levels that you want us to follow, uh, this is your opportunity to uh, provide us that information and we can make those changes. So um, I'm going to leave it in your hands for now. Any questions at this point? Yes, Mr. Schlesner. Uh, Mighty Oaks on their own well or are they on city water? They're on their own well. And everybody else within the district is city water, correct? That's correct. So you plan on having the same testing schedule for Mighty Oaks even though they're on their own well? It's kind of a different situation when you're on your own well, correct? Yes. Go ahead. And we tested Mighty Oaks um, recently as well as the Department of Health as monitoring Mighty Oaks the first two years because of the new well. So they're testing that quarterly, then that'll move to annually. And I just spoke with Andrew Sirik from our facilities department and uh, he verified their testing as well as on top of ours, they're testing for copper and other items associated with wells. And the, the city must do some as well, correct? <coughs> for the city supply? I'm not, I imagine they do, yes. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Sealinger. Um, so in the, the uh, document you gave us, uh, all the way down to Appendix E, uh, just a point of clarity, uh, it's the EPA fact sheet, lead in drinking water coolers. <laughs> a water cooler is really a water fountain, correct? <laughs> it's not a, it's not the Culligan cooler <laughs> with the, <laughs> the upside down bottle. <laughs> Correct. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and we are just testing the water fountains or the bubblers, as they may say if we were in a different part of the country, right? Um, but we don't test the water, say, out of the bathroom faucet that if the kid sticks or wants to get a drink out of the bathroom faucet, we don't test that supply? Is it, or is it the same supply? We do. Okay. Not every single one. Okay. But certainly any uh, fountains, but then also any... Uh, most of the classrooms where they have Sinks. Where any, think. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and so we're looking at ways, we, we have a lot of different ideas. Uh, that is one of our concerns is uh, like in a classroom where they have a sink and it's mm -hmm. not utilized very often except right. when they're doing art projects, for instance. And uh, we have found in our testing that those seem to be always higher. Uh, we, we, over the past couple years, we've reduced them by replacing faucet fixtures, all that kind of thing to take the, the lead fittings out of there, but we had talked about potentially putting a different type of faucet on there that would prevent somebody from actually getting a water bottle under there. Mm -hmm. So the only way you could really use it would be to wash your hands. Mm -hmm. We've talked about placarding as well. Uh, Olmstead County uses, like down at the government center, they have placards on each of their, if you've seen that, where you're mm -hmm. supposed to run the water 30 seconds before uh, you actually drink it. Uh, so we've talked about all those ideas as well. Feel free to jump in. Right well, interestingly enough, as you say that, we've had a number of conversation of how far or how far should we go, and we really reviewed it over the last two years and kind of picked the brains of a bunch of different departments, and interestingly enough, we always considered outdoor spigots and water taps as, you know, sprinkling or exterior water, but we did have a few sites that athletics used it, so we in turn sampled oh. those. So we're constantly trying to find different sources that are used, and they kind of refer to it as a potable water source rather than, you know, a mop sink or a bathroom, as you would say. And so those are all targeted for lead and water testing. That's great. Thank you. Now we need to um, adapt a plan by July 1st, so we have a couple of weeks still. In it. Yes. Personally, I'd feel comfortable if we just spent a little bit more time looking at this since we have the time. Okay. It looks fantastic, though. Thank you. Uh, 
7.07 uh, acceptance of proposals for the sale of the district's refuse business. This is an action item. Good evening, board members. As you can see, wait a minute. Oh, sorry. You got to do the resolution. resolution. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I was, I was on a roll there, okay. <laughs> um, be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 approves the bid for the sale of the dis uh, district's refuse business to Hometown Haulers LLC in the amount of $230,000 pending approval of the refuse license transfer by the Olmstead County Board. Board approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes, uh, if you remember at our last regular meeting, there were, was one outstanding question that we had and, and uh, Scott and I think Andrew spent some time uh, and even John uh, working with Olmstead County and uh, so this, what we're gonna present tonight is uh, a potential resolution to the issue that we had and I'm gonna let Scott kind of talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Yes, on May 17th, John Carlson, Andrew Sirk, and I met with uh, representatives from Olmstead County. Uh, John Helmers, Director of Environmental Resources, Eric Brower, the Assistant Controller, and Tom Kinnan, the, the, an Assistant County Attorney. And they, we made them aware of our concerns regarding the innovation agreement that we had talked about at the last board meeting and what you asked us to bring back and talk to the county about. And what they agreed to do is to provide us a supplemental agreement that would limit our liability uh, to the amount of dollars minus the, uh, the two garbage trucks and the dumpster values. So the bid from hometown haulers was $230,000. We estimated the bid or the, the value of the two trucks and the dumpsters at about $40,000. So what Olmsted County did is they took the remaining $190,000 that was, uh, would have been our profit and said, we will only hold you liable f up to that $190,000. They don't anticipate any issues at all, and but they did say that this whole novation agreement ends July 1st of 2022 anyway, so come 2022, we're free and clear. So if we take that $190,000, potentially put it in a savings account for uh, four years, and then it'll be our money free and clear unless something happens with hometown haulers. Obviously, this all requires county board approval still, including the supplemental piece. Uh, Assistant Attorney Canaan was very confident that the county board would accept the supplemental agreement as well. And so uh, if we get approved tonight, uh, we'll get moving forward on all the paperwork that's required here that we have to fill out in order to start this process. Uh, and as, a, as an aside, we are having it reviewed again by uh, some district council as well just to make sure everything is uh, is appropriate that we need to have. Questions, concerns? Ms. Becker. So you're not anticipating that there's gonna be any, so if we, because I'm thinking we may be approving this tonight, so there's not, so if, if the lawyer comes back and, and says, no, 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 wait, you gotta switch this, you just come back to us? I mean, yes. is that what we're all yeah. thinking? Yeah, we'd bring it back and ask you to change your... Okay, absolutely. And, and we will, uh, we'll have, you know, just like we, actually we already have a line item in the budget for reference truck, so we'll just mm -hmm. put that money there and just in case, we don't anticipate any issues with this company, but if something would happen, that money would be there to cover that. And in three years, they could come back and be part of the competitive bidding process for yep. business, right? Yep. Any other questions or comments? Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Sheridan. Uh, 7.08, approval of user agreement for Oculars video access for Rochester Police Department. This is a briefing item. Yes, uh, Scott's going to brief us uh, on this item, but I, I just a couple things I want to say before Scott. Uh, one of the uh, things that I personally struggled with and, um, is when we um, 
entered into our new agreement with our police liaison officers, there was a lot of discussion about having access to to our video cameras, and and at that time, our attorneys said no, and and uh, they shouldn't because of data privacy. And I, I personally struggled with that because if if um, heaven forbid that we have a, an active shooter in one of our schools um i'm probably going to break the law and say yeah i want you to look at our cameras and feel, find out where the bad guy is and go get him so what this really does is it puts an agreement in place that only really situations like that will they have access to our cameras uh, we have the ability to um, know who access Assess the cameras right now, so we can we can uh, audit that. And the agreement also requires them to notify us uh, when they want to access the the cameras. I don't know, if, Scott, if you have anything else you want to say about that. Yeah, you, you hit all the major points. Uh, the police department and and I have been negotiating this, and the superintendent asked me to bring it to our district council, who reviewed it extensively as well. And I know the superintendent has some conversations with other big nine schools about their process related to this. But our, uh, our council actually uh, found two other memos of understanding that from uh, two other school districts in the country, uh, rather large ones. And in the review of those particular MOUs, those were, I, date, I believe they're dated February and March of 2018. One was from Lincoln, Nebraska. And the other one, yeah, and the other one was from uh, <laughs> Fort Worth, Texas. And when I read them, and it, with the council, I, I thought that they were very broad and very. Uh, I mean, they allowed access almost 24 hours a day if that those police departments needed, and that, that isn't what we were looking for. Nor was that what the police department was looking for, because they're well aware of the data privacy rules, both statewide and federally, and. And so did John Edison uh, from our district, our attorney or from Raslaw. So as we negotiated all this and drew up the, the proposal, I, I think ours is very structured, very, the parameters are set very clearly when uh, they, they'd be allowed to view this. Uh, it's only in exigent circumstances that they're allowed to uh, view it. They would be provided a uh, login and the credentials necessary to do that. One concern that I did have with just providing them that information is, based on my own experience with the camera system, we have a lot of cameras. And if you don't train or understand what cameras see what particular parts of the building or know what you're looking at, if you don't have that experience with it, you're going to be pretty well lost on when you, like for John Marshall, who I think they have 66 different cameras. and if, you're popping on all these different cameras, you're not really going to know what you're looking at. So the, in my, my eye, along with the police department, we said there, there has to be some type of training allowance here where they're going to be able to get on there and practice with it so they, they can become familiar with it. And it's only limited to uh, the four liaison officers and the liaison supervisor. Those other agreements that we looked at, this was department-wide. Any officer could look at. And again, we narrowed down our parameters in order to keep it just to the liaison officers. And so I think this is a very appropriate, uh, very detailed, uh, limited access that uh, in my eyes, and I want to know with the superintendent as well, protects us that in those actors and circumstances where they need to get on the camera to, for the life safety issues of our staff, students, and, and other visitors, that uh, this allows them to do that. And if I, I can provide some examples, like the thought process behind it is um, if you have a liaison officer at, we'll say, Mayo High School, I'm not picking any school for any particular reason, but if you have the liaison officer at Mayo High School and there's an incident that's occurring way up northwest at one of our schools, that liaison officer can log into the Ocularis camera system and as the patrol division and the first responders and the fire department are responding, whether it's a fire in a building and you have people trapped or it's a, put, a potential active shooter situation, that officer can be on there directing the first responders, looking to see what's live feeds coming from that particular building and be able to direct them safely to uh, 
for the responder safety and for the, hopefully in, improve any rescues or protect the lives of the staff and students and visitors in the school. And that's just one example that uh, a scenario that we had talked about when we were designing this. So, Mr. Sheridan, so you're saying that the school district has set the parameters and that the, the situation has to rise almost to like a 911 type event. Not necessarily just a 911. It has to go a little further than that. A life safety event of an exigent circumstance where someone's life's in danger. They use 911 for if they need a response because they have a medical or something, and, and that wouldn't be any appropriate use of the camera. I don't even view uh, you know a, a pushing match in the hallway as anything where they're going to be viewing or using the camera. If they want copies of to view that video of that pushing match where there, where there might be potential charges or something, then they follow the normal process where they would have to get a search warrant and they go through me to get that and I do all the FERPA notifications so that uh, we're well covered on that. So um, it's in your hands on this one. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, each liaison would have their own unique user ID and password? Yes. And access would be audited on a regular basis? I was figuring a monthly basis, yeah. And I figured I'd keep a log of it and so I'd know when they're, I mean, if they used it for a certain situation, we'll just keep a log of every time they, they access it and whether it's a exigent circumstance or a, a training issue. And they know full well that the, the training, they have to come through me to get approval prior to even doing it for training and it's gonna be when students are not present. In the buildings. Any other questions? Yeah, Ms. Seelinger. Um, so, uh, appreciation to uh, the superintendent for his honesty. He's going to do what needs to be done in the, in <laughs> the circumstances, and might as well just put it out there. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate you talking about the training. I think that's that's really important and something that um, you know those of us. You know, might not think about that. That's it's probably a very complicated system. We don't need to get into it. But um, if scenario, if we didn't have uh, this access, um, would would then it be, would, would then it fall to a staff member potentially to be monitoring this if there was a situation and then trying to be that conduit? Yes. Okay. And staff members need to be doing staff member stuff. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Which is probably more student focused at the moment than perhaps uh, something in the term of a, a police or fire matter that uh, those professionals could probably best handle. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sheridan. 7.09, approval for continuation of the Microsoft enrollment for education solutions briefing item. Yes, at this time, uh, I'm gonna have to go to the bullpen and call um, Mike Johnson, Assistant Director of Technology up to uh, fill in for Heather who had a, a family situation tonight. So, uh, Mike. Good evening, members of the board. You're not the B squad. <laughs> He's a reliever. They're, I'm the relievers are really important to a team. Oh, is it a sports metaphor I didn't get again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, tonight I'm here to brief you on uh, the continuation of our Microsoft agreement, which covers uh, all the software and licensure, as well as office products for all our staff and students. Um, we did go out to our uh, vendor from last year, who was under state contract, for a quote to extend that for another year. Um, it did come back at $127,560. That is a slight increase. Um, it, it seems to be that way across the board. Um, but I'm here to ask uh, your approvals for continuation for another year on the Microsoft agreement. Mr. Schlesner. As the district has moved to use more Google products, has that reduced any of the Microsoft costs? With this, I, I did ask that question if we could um, cut out some of the portion of the Microsoft products, but it seems like they're trying to bundle this in for another year. Um, we did, they did come back with a three-year agreement, which we were not comfortable doing, just because there are more of our staff using Google, which will, I think, um, decrease our overall cost in the future, but 
at this time we we didn't have enough time to, to go through that process but that is something we are looking to do um, very much so thank you and the information provided here says that this organization is required to provide the lowest possible price through state contract pricing right. um, the collective pricing through the state yes okay Ms. Um, and again, like with our food service, I, I hope that that is helpful uh, to us and gives us a, a better deal. Um, and then also, just as you mentioned, uh, you know, you looked at a three-year deal but felt that one year is better. So uh, thank you for um, being uh, not critical. What's the word? Thorough. Making good decisions on our behalf. Of that. <laughs> well, we, we all we have to be good stewards of uh, good stewards. The funds. Being good stewards, um, so and that's we, something we, we actively do yes. with everything. Yes, so just want to express appreciation for that. Other questions, comments? I can move this to action. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move this to action. Any discussion? All in favor of moving it to action, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the quote in the amount of $127,560.12 from Insight Public Sector for the continuation of the Microsoft Enrollment for Education Solutions necessary to maintain Microsoft software and licenses on district PC hardware for staff and students. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. 7.10 approval of the 2018 2019 <laughs> school district budget. This is a briefing item. Mr. Yes. Uh, Mike was just a one pitcher reliever, <laughs> so I'm going go, gonna to go to the left hander now. Uh, with, with John being homesick, uh, Eric Brown, manager of budgeting, will uh, brief us on this agenda item. Should we clap or something so he feels more confident? <laughs> Understudy. 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 Yeah. Understudy. Oh, come on, let's just leave it. He's a lefty. <laughs> Good evening, board, me board members. Um, here's a presentation of our overall budget that John, Mr. Carlson went into more detail a couple weeks ago. Uh, a couple background items. Uh, school board does have to approve the budget before July 1st uh, per the state statutes. Also, our fund balance, we do have to keep the 6% per the school board uh, moving forward as well. A couple of revenue assumptions that we did place into the budget at this point. Uh, the basic general education aid of six thousand three hundred twelve dollars per three hundred twelve dollars per per pupil unit. Uh, the voter approved referendum of eight hundred seventy dollars and three cents. The local op local optional revenue of four hundred twenty four dollars, and the school board approved referendum of uh, one hundred sixty six dollars and sixty five cents. Uh, there's also a bunch of restricted funds, i.e. Uh, grants, donations, other restricted use funds that will the, does match revenue and expenditures within there as well. Uh, a couple expenditure assumptions we put in there. The teachers and principals have now settled, so we did put that in that information in there. Uh, at this point, all other groups have not settled for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, most contracted services, supplies, capital expenditures uh, were held constant to the 2017-2018 original budget. And also, the uh, school building principals did receive a standardized formula, which generally increased uh, their uh, site supply budgets as well. Uh, a couple of reductions that we've done for district-wide, we did reduce the transportation budget. We did uh, kind of over budget for this year with the opening of Mighty Oaks and not knowing exactly what was going to happen within there. Uh, we also did reduce the number of paid days for certain administrators within there. So from a district-wide account, it's a total reduction of about $845,000. Could I jump in here real quick and ask if there's anything new on uh, the city agreement with busing? And if that would affect uh, the No, because the, the earliest that that would potentially impact would be the 1920 the school year. Budget. Yeah. 
At the site level, we did implement a uh, standardized staffing formula for all sites. Uh, this, was, this did entail a reduction of about $696,000 from the school building accounts as well. A few enhancements that we did do, uh, we did budget about a $48,000 paraprofessional trainer to help our paraprofessionals with different tasks that they may have. Uh, also adding a fifth police liaison about $62,000 to support the middle schools as well. Uh, we did include the FTE variances back from uh, April 30th, 2017 to March 31st, 2018 and what we're projecting as of 514. Um, well, that should say 2018 as well, sorry about that. Uh, as you can kind of run down the list, there's not a whole lot of variation between the March 31st, 2018 and the 514 numbers. Uh, the total, the grand total number, uh, does. there's a small reduction in there. Also within the teacher group, we have budgeted, as Mr. Carlson said a couple weeks ago, the additional 10 FTE for um, things that may come up throughout, uh, from now through the beginning of school and next year as well. So in summary, uh, at this point we have not included any funding from legislature. Uh, we did do the reductions for the district wide of 845,000, the, at the site level of 696,000. Um, the unassigned fund balance will exceed projection for the 2017-2018 school year and it will be greater than board policy for 2018-2019 at this point. Uh, we, this is a balanced budget of about 224 million. Any questions? Just a reminder for those that are out in the audience or watching this later, uh, we spent uh, several hours in a, in a study session going over the budget in much more detail than, than we did tonight. And it's available online. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. All right, thank thanks. you. Seven point one six approval of revisions to the policies and procedures manual. Ms. Becker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's so there's several um, policies to look at. So um, so the first one, two oh one on the legal status of the um, school school board. Um, we basically needed to um, change the wording to the current mission statement. Uh, we had the previous one, so we thought we need to update it for what we, what our mission is now. So that's really the only change in that one. Is there any questions? You weren't inspired to go back to the old one. You know, no, no. We thought we'd leave it. <laughs> But thank you. Um, so then the next one, um, 202. Um, just as um, we're trying as we go through the um, policies, if we see one of them that has a procedure, um, we usually try to get rid of that. If you don't know, our, we have policies and then we also have another section that's procedures. Um, in some of the, in some, Previous policies, they include what the procedures are, and just now as we're trying to go, go through our, our policies, we've just decided that we're taking all the procedures out in there. We're not getting rid of the procedures, they're just going into the procedure section. So that was just, <clears throat> that was one that we found that had a procedure still, so we are taking that out. Um, 20301. Um, That one, let's see. Um, that one looks like we just had um, changed one word or a couple words. Um, we're <clears throat> some of the policies when we're going through them, we're trying to find some more generic language than um, <clears throat> mailing or emailing or something. So we just so we wanted to change it to like notifying. So. The next thing after email comes along, we don't have to, <laughs> the next group doesn't have to go back and change it to whatever. So people will still be notified. 
Um, 20305. Um, um, for this one, again, we're um, just for clarity's sake and to avoid confusion, there's some procedures, the words in there are procedures. So, again, we're just trying to find other words, just um, changing it to process instead of procedure. And then um, after Roman numeral three, it was procedures, but it wasn't really the procedure that would go into the procedure section. So we're like, okay, well, that's just too confusing. So we just switched the, the name. And then we also added <clears throat> for the, um, um, we also added vice chair. <laughs> Excuse me for um, because the vice chair now meets with the executive committee to help develop the agenda. So we added vice chair. Um, on the uh, consent agendas, now this one um, there was a new statute that changed um, the upper limit. Um, so uh, things that can go on the consent agenda to one hundred seventy-five thousand. So anything that is under 175,000 could just automatically go on the consent agenda. Um, <clears throat> this is, so in this particular um, policy, we're changing it to 175,000. However, as a board, we still need to decide, do we want to have Mike notify us when something is over 100,000 and still hear about it? Um, <clears throat> with the change in the statute, Mike wouldn't have to notify us or, I mean, we wouldn't necessarily be notified in, unless it was over 175,000. Just for a point of reference, when Gary and I and Julie all started, that number was 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> so just for a point of reference. So now it's at 100. Um, it could move up to 175, but I think that's something that we as a board should talk about maybe at a retreat or something if we want to change that. Um, right now, I'll just continue doing the, using the hundred thousand yeah. until we have a chance to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so two o four. Um, this one again, we we're trying to find just a little bit more generic language. Um, the word journal was in there. Julie started talking about that she was finding some of her old journals in her basement, <laughs> and she thought, well, let's maybe change this. So we thought document was a more appropriate um, word. Um, so 205, um, <clears throat> this one, we didn't really, we basically changed the order of stuff. We didn't change the words. We didn't change much of anything else. We just kind of changed the order of things. Um, let's see, 206, this one, um, this one again had a section called procedures, um, and again, just to kind of get out of procedures, um, again, this was one of them that is not going into the procedures section, um, but we just felt, again, for clarity, we should take the word procedure out and change that. Um, the next one, 207. Um, and that's the one I didn't get back. Oh, I thought it was 208. Wasn't it 208? Oh, you're right. I think. Yeah. I think. So 207, um, again, the procedures, and we're switching the language. Um, so 212, um, we just changed one word from expected to encouraged. Um, and let's see, are there, are there more of them, Wendy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, really? <laughs> really, Wendy? Yep. All right. Um, so 
the curriculum. All right, so where are my other sheets? Um, this is the one where Juliet asked to have yeah. that. Because there was a section on this one yeah. that um, Director Workman. Yeah, we removed because it, yes. those because kids are no longer. Kids already oh, they've passed. already graduated, yeah. so they're. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. They have different graduation requirements. Yep. Um. Okay, I am really struggling with this now. Okay, so six o. <laughs> Will that help you? So but we're on to thirteen. So we're just talking about the seven o one. Yeah, seven o one point o two. Is that where we are? Yeah. No, I know. Um. So six thirteen. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> seven o one purchase of goods and services. Um. Is, okay, that one was just a procedure removal for that one. All right. And 802. Was this the one that you, no, no, 802 we had. I don't remember us. Okay, this was another one that changed to the 175,000. Right. Other ones? No, that was and before we're just you want to you mention that you talked about the other four and there were no changes there. Right. Yes. Okay. There was, yep. Okay. Yeah. And just about some other ones and yeah. Yeah, no changes. Just a reminder the the board uh, one of the board subcommittees is a uh, the policy policies. committee so the three board members and myself spent a lot of time reviewing these and making changes it wasn't even though tonight you just saw a yeah. quick summary. Right. And we, uh, we will not vote on these tonight, but do you have any questions? Ms. Seelinger? Um, I don't have any questions. Uh, just thanks to the committee. I know that um, this can get a little bogged down and sticky and um, seem kind of dry, but I mean, policy is the work of the board and this is what yeah. we're, a lot of what we are here for. So it is important work and um, I think, uh, you know, careful consideration, especially catching those, you know, updating some of those things that we don't need in anymore. Um, it, it's kind of the graduation requirements was kind of interesting because I remember when all that stuff went into the policy. Yep. <laughs> so I've been around long enough now. It's we're done with that group. Um, so it's uh, it it can be a little tedious, but but it can be it, it it really does speak to the the meat of what we what we do around here. So thanks for your work on that. Thank Board you. Board and staff. Thank you. Um, seven point one seven closed session. Pursuant to Minnesota statutes, sections thirteen. D.05, subdivision 2A3, a move to go into closed session for consideration of educational data and the administration's recommendation with respect to the proposed removal from enrollment of students who are not in compliance with the requirements for Minnesota statute section 121A.15. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move into closed session. Any discussion? No discussion. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are in closed session at 7.32 p.m. I accepts and adopts the facts and conclusion outlined in the notice of proposed expulsion as the basis for its decision. School board hereby expels the student from the schools of Independent School District 535 Rochester from June 5th, 2018 through June 4th, 2019. The superintendent or a designee is directed to mail the following to the student and the student's parent. A copy of this resolution and a later letter stating that the student has been expelled from June 5th, 2018 through June 4th, 2019 and may apply to resume attending school in the district the first school day after the period of expulsion ends. Superintendent or a designee is directed to identify the alternative educational services or special education and related services that are available to the student during the period of expulsion if the student wishes to take advantage of them. The superintendent or a designee is directed to make an electronic report of this expulsion to the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Education within 30 calendar days as required under Minnesota statutes section 121A.53. Be it further resolved that the student is not allowed in any Rochester Public Schools property except for the building to which the student is assigned, nor is the student allowed to participate 
and any extracurricular school activities during the period of this expulsion. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. And this meeting is adjourned at 7.42 p.m.